I'm James Roncey. I'm the head of literature here at the South Bank Centre. Um, I was born in 1959 when homosexuality was still illegal in this country, uh, two years after the Wolfenden Report and eight years before the 1967 Sexual Offences Act, which offered a limited decriminalisation of homosexuality that incorporated restrictions that were only overturned by the European Court of Human Rights in the year 2000. I think it's important that within my lifetime and many of our lifetimes, attitudes have changed not fast enough but still far more speedily than perhaps uh, 100 years ago. As a liberal Londoner uh, working here at the South Bank, one might think the battle for the acceptance of social and sexual difference had been won. But we all know that's not true. This might be the case in pockets of urban tolerance and sophistication, but we know that the ability to be confident, free, unharassed as a gay man is often a matter of metropolitan luck. Homophobia was never going away, and perhaps like feminist response to everyday sexism, it has to be uh, fought, and the battle for equality has to be fought every day. Globally, of course, the situation is even worse, with this week's proposals in Nigeria by President Goodluck Jonathan to make homosexual acts punishable by 14 years in prison, with 10 years in prison for public displays of affection. Even speaking about homosexuality without condemning it an offence carries a jail term. This means that were we having this debate in Nigeria, it would be illegal. Uh, President Goodluck Jonathan is a man, as is President Putin. And so one might ask what men, some men, find so threatening about homosexuality. And in the context of this weekend, perhaps so, in inverted commas, unmasculine. As if being gay makes you less of a man, effeminate, camp, unmanly, and by implication, weak. Rather like the Roman fear of the ancient Greeks, the idea that homosexuality might make you less of a warrior and less Roman. These typical traditional and limited notions of masculinity can be characterised perhaps by men's magazines, which generally exclude the gay experience. The strapline for Esquire magazine is sports, cars, human fashion, culture, tech, food. GQ is style, watches, entertainment, girls. And Loaded offers girls, style, sport. These men's magazines do not tend to allow... These men's magazines do not tend to allow uh, homosexuality into the arena of masculine discussion, stretching only as far as the limited campery of male fashion. This, therefore, limits any discussion about a richer understanding of masculinity, one that embraces gay opinion, experience and culture. And so what we hope to achieve this morning is a discussion in which we can celebrate gay culture as an integral part of a wider, more nuanced and thoughtful definition of masculinity. In short, how can being gay add to, change, reinterpret and refresh our notions of masculinity and improve our understanding of being a man? With me here to discuss the issues are the Out, and the ci out in the City editor, David Hudson, on my right, and on my next to me is the poet and is the uh, British Army Reserve Patrol Commander and finance worker. Fin finance worker is a polite word for banker. Uh, <laughs> Carl Barnes, and uh, the poet and sports writer, Musa Okwanga. So, uh, that's enough of me speaking. I'm going to speak very, very little, and I'm going to hand over to Carl to kick us off. Sure, so um, my name's Carl Barnes, and I'm a, a gay man that lives in London. Um, the first thing I want to talk about, really, is uh, when I came out. And I think there's a biog of me floating around somewhere that says I did so proudly. But um, actually, of course, the, the, act the events were somewhat a little bit more chaotic than that. And, you know, I think most people experience either a little push, or some people a strong push, and other people a pull of maybe just being in an environment where they could come out freely. Actually, in my case, it was uh, my father walking into my bedroom. And um, it was at that very second that I just opened up a picture on MSN that a, a guy had sent to me. Um, well, that's my recollection of it. There was probably actually an awkward moment because there was a 56K dial-up modem of the <laughs> face coming in and me looking at my dad and then the screen and then the chest and my dad and the screen <laughs> and then the hard-on. And then it's OK, this is what we're dealing with here, door slam. On we go. At that time, I'd accepted it in myself, but there's a process that anybody that isn't in the heteronormative model or isn't gay or, or isn't straight, rather, um, has to have a scrutiny of, them, of themselves um, and, and a flux, really, and, and a self-reflection before they can 
then actually speak confidently with other people and say, yes, I'm gay and, 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 and this is me. So a few years later then I, I moved to London and that's when I, I joined the, the Reserve Army and I then joined the, uh, the regular army for a couple of years and I fought in Afghanistan in, in 2010. Um, and it was then that I was lifted outside of the London bubble that I created for myself and, and then up to Yorkshire um, with a group of men that were, were very different from, from my friends and <clears throat> eventually they actually all, all accepted me uh, aside from one. Um, I then went through that process again when I got to Afghanistan and I was, uh, the circumstances were I was taken from that group and immediately put into a, a completely different group as an individual. But by that point, I was used to talking about it. And so I just said, yeah, you know, I'm, I'm gay. Actually, I've got a boyfriend. I don't have a girlfriend when that question was posed. And so that was more of a development for me. Now, that one person that did have an objection was, a, was another soldier, actually. Uh, this is the strongest objection, really. Um, and we, uh, I was in a nightclub. And he came up to me and said, why are you dancing like a faggot? And I just kind of leaned in and said, because I am one. And then a, uh, a reign of fury was unleashed uh, upon me. And, and really, I look at that as, a, as an example of somebody that hasn't upped their game when it comes to acceptance. And, and that's a phrase that's actually come from one of my um, commanders in the army that he said, you know, when, when I was working with you, Carl, I realized I had to, to up my game um, in, in, in simple things sometimes. And just that when I'm using uh, a synonym for bad, when I say gay, that's actually you're in the room. That's affecting, that's affecting you. So what I'm hoping today is that I can speak about some of my experiences and, um, and make people think about perhaps upping their game or just consider how uh, their self-reflection can just make everyone uh, a little bit happier. Thank you. Now, David, you're the editor of a, of a, of a gay magazine, Gay Men's Magazine. Yeah. Um, tell us what that means in terms of your life and also your social interaction. Um, well, I've been a writer and an editor with the British gay press for pretty much 20 years, and in that time I've covered so many gay stories. I've interviewed so many gay men from all walks of life, from sportsmen to pop stars to gay dads to just the ordinary man on the street. So I think, you know, that's given me, and obviously I'm gay myself, so that's given me some insight into the gay experience and gay oppression. And working in the gay press, I think sometimes there's a danger of, of feeling a bit ghettoized and thinking, you know, how, what is the situation outside of Soho? What is the situation outside of London? Um, is it as bad as, you know, am I being paranoid? I wrote a piece for The Independent this week about homophobia and gay oppression and how I think it doesn't just affect gay men. I think it affects society. I think it affects straight men. I think it affects the way that men express themselves in the way in what they choose to wear, in what they choose to reveal about themselves, in the way they behave. I think it affects everyone. Um, and that's changing, but only very, very slowly. Um, there is still oppression, there is still homophobia. As already mentioned, outside the UK, there's dreadful oppression, you know, violent, violent homophobia. Working in the job I do, Carl's already mentioned coming out. Coming out, as, as, as most people know, is an ongoing process. I don't choose to hide my sexuality. One of the comments that I had this week un under my piece in The Independent was, I don't care about your sexuality, I just wish you weren't in my face about it. People, you know, the first question people ask me, strangers ask me when I'm introduced to them, I was at an event yesterday, a launch of a new website by a charity, what job do you do? And so I say, I'm the editor of a, of a gay magazine. So... And yet I still get this feeling that I am somehow rubbing their faces in it or flaunting it and not just shutting up about it. There is this attitude of, well, I don't care, just, you know, don't talk about it, don't demonstrate it, but I'm not oppressing you. And that's, so I still, that's the form of oppression that I come across most often. It was very shocking, David's piece in The Independent, because I read it and thought it was a completely well-reasoned argument. And then I did what David did, which is a mistake if you ever, if you ever write an article, is to read the comments. 
I don't really welcome feedback. I think every time I write a piece, I want to say, I do not welcome your feedback. I do not, know, do not want to know what you think about what I've just written. Just read it. Um, but it was the homophobia that David was subject. It was utterly appalling in the independent, for God's sake. I mean, it was ridiculous. So this battle has to be fought every day. And uh, I was just asking Musa whether I could, had to, was allowed to ask him about, obviously, the double prejudice that uh, Musa has had to face. So Musa. Yeah, um, so my name's uh, Musa Okwonga. I am a poet, um, a journalist, and also a football writer. And I suppose in terms of uh, prejudice, I mean, it's interesting. Well, I, I think it's interesting, but I'm a narcissist. Um, <laughs> so I, would, it, it, I had a quite strange path because I, I came out at the age of 21 having had a girlfriend for two years because I started, I developed an attraction to men. I was like, oh, men are very attractive. Right, so I broke up with her. And, um, which was a very difficult conversation to have, but it was all great. We're still friends, and I emceed at her wedding, so it has a happy ending. Um, well, not uh, necessarily for her. Well, <laughs> <laughs> when you see her husband, you'll see it was an upgrade. So, uh, um, so we, I lived for the next eight years as a gay man um, until about five years ago, and then ended up, well, a girl ended up basically approaching me, um, and uh, we ended up going out for a couple of months, and I was like, well, what am I? Uh, then ended up, seeing guys and girls, so another girl for two years. So I'm kind of, I suppose I'm queer, really. But um, for the purposes of today, I'm a, I'm a gay man, so please forget my heterosexual history. Um, but sorry, but back, to your, back to your point about the dual prejudice. So when I, um, as a black man, this is the thing, they can tell you're black from 100 yards away. If you, as, a, as a gay person, um, you make that revelation, you can make that revelation in a place that suddenly becomes very hostile very quickly. And that can be your own community, it can be your own household. And certainly I experienced, you know, really... Um, quite troubling levels of homophobia in my sort of immediate environment. And as we know, like my parents are Ugandan, well, we don't know that, but you know that now. So, um, and as we know in Uganda, uh, they're currently driving through the sort of the, anti, uh, the anti-gay bill at the moment, they're trying to. And in terms of the dual prejudice, it's funny because it manifests in weird ways because black men are objectified in the gay world. There's no question about that. Sexually, we're objectified. Um, and things are expected of us sexually that they wouldn't expect necessarily other races. I know this because I, I'm not going to go into detail. It's a family show. Um, but also, like, you notice the prejudice in, in the football world as well, because I write about sport, and there aren't many out, you know, footballers. There aren't many out journalists. There aren't many out, you know, if you get outside the entertainment industries, how many out football writers are there? There's two of us. We can count them. So there's still a massive journey to go in, and I think, actually, as time goes on, I probably experience more... Um, prejudice, I think, maybe on the on the sort of on, on the homophobic side than than the race side, which which surprises me. I think surprises me. But I'm interested in professional tolerance. I mean, in particularly masculine worlds. Obviously, the army is a particularly masculine world. We as assu- we would assume that journalism and theatre, for example, were more tolerant professions. But have you been surprised in the army? Were you surprised in the army by some <coughs> acts of unexpected tolerance, perhaps? Absolutely. So I can remember um, uh, having those conversations that were, um, so what are you doing this weekend? In reality, I was going out with my my boyfriend to do this or that, and it'd be like, well, I'm going to the cinema. And then finish that conversation, move on to the next one. I I made a conscious decision um, when I'd been with the regular army after a couple of months to say, actually, you know, you need to man up. Man (laughs) up, Man up. You need to take responsibility for yourself here and, um, and say... Uh, and just stop lying, um, because otherwise you're going to uh, compromise yourself and maybe compromise other people's experience in the future. And so one day I was sat down with my, my sergeant. He was a very stern gentleman. He uh, had a, uh, one of those people you never quite knew if he was laughing or if he was being deadly serious. And he just said to me, what are you doing this weekend? And I said, well, actually, I'm going down to visit my boyfriend in Cornwall. He's there um, uh, working this weekend. And he just said, oh, OK, so are you gay then? I was like, yeah, 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 I'm gay, and um, I've been with this guy for this long, and da 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 And he said, oh, okay, well, cool, well, I'm going to go here. And then it just moved on. And then, of course, it then got around the, uh, the battery, the unit that I was in. And actually, their reaction was, um, well, why didn't you tell me sooner? Because I feel like our level of connection, um, well, this is how it felt to me. It felt that they were saying that our level of connection has been limited by you holding that information back. And, mm. you know, because talking about your, your private life is, is um, when you go from being an acquaintance to a friend, really. And it was, um, they felt that they'd missed out on that process with me because I'd held, withheld that information. Uh, and how much do you feel that you have to 
keep changing attitudes. How much do you feel it's, David, you have run a magazine. You have to actually, your role is, is a campaigning one. Um, I definitely feel that's part of it. I think working in the gay press, obviously most of the audience, the, the readership are gay, so I'm not sort of trying to educate heterosexual people to gay rights or whatever, um, apart from the odd column piece. And writing for a gay audience, I, my responsibility to keep them informed, to keep them aware of, you know, changes, whatever's happening. And also, I do kind of feel it's part of my responsibility to sort of bolster self-esteem, to make people feel better about themselves, not to feel ashamed, to feel proud of who they are. And how much music do you have to feel sometimes in conversations, here we go again, I've got to do this all over again? Just, you know, you think, oh, uh, uh, here we go. Uh, I don't know, I mean, it, it just got to be done. I was having a conversation last night with a friend of mine, and he actually said, you know, why, why do you wear your sexuality like a badge? You know, you seem to wear it like a bit of a badge. And I was like, I'm not being funny, but, like, you kind of have to. Like, everyone else does. Straight people, no one asks them why they... You know, you talk about your kids, you're wearing your sexuality like a badge. You know, you, you talk about your private life, and, you know, that, that's what you're doing. Well, I suppose um, up to a point, you yeah. don't have to defend your heterosexuality, do you? Heterosexual people don't have to go yeah. into a room. Don't feel, I mean, they feel, natu uh, um, they feel naturally at ease. They don't have to, you know, they, uh, they, don't, have to they don't have to do that sigh yeah. like women have to do when faced with sexism. You know, you think, why do, I have to, why do I have to fight this all over again? Do you ever have that? Presumably you do. Sometimes, but then here's the thing. When I came out, there was nobody that I looked at like me, who was 10, 15 years older, in the media at all. There were no out football writers that I could see. There were no out, you know, journalists doing what I did, you know, and I just thought to myself, where the hell are they? There were no, you know, not that many sort of out black musicians. And I sat there and I was like, what the hell is this all about? And I thought, I've got to do it. I've got to do it. Because otherwise, what's the point? And every time I think, oh, I've got to do it again, I think of myself being, you know, 20 years old thinking, how's my life going to turn out? And thinking, you've got to do it for that person who's like you 10 years younger. You've got to do it for that person who's 15, 5 years old who you're never going to meet. You have to make their life easier somehow. So the responsibility, the burden, it's outweighed by the fact that it's doing some benefit. And you, you I think, came out in stages, didn't you? There's a sort of staged outing. Yes, I mean, I mean I, to explain, I mean, I came out at, um, at uni. I came out to my then-girlfriend, and then the week later I was the LGB society, LGBT society. Because I knew that, I knew that like, if I went there at uni, the word would get around, so just do it in one go. Just do it, you know. Um, so I made sure that I was, you know, super cool, made sure I was looking good, like, go along, guys. And I, and I knew that people would be like, what the hell is he doing here if I had to do that? But in terms of coming out on stages, that was in relation to my family. And I told my mother a year before I told anybody else in the family because I wanted her to have time to process it and deal with it because I knew what her cultural upbringing had been. Um, of course, everyone talked anyway, so within a few weeks, I was getting emails going, what's this about you being gay? And I'm like, that's the family grapevine. But I, I did that in stages to sort of respect her, you know, sort of primacy as the head of the family. And what do you all think about this? this wh why do you think um, some definitions of masculinity are so much need to be redefined, rethought? I mean, that the idea of being a real man uh, what we, you know, what one, what Jeremy Clarkson would call a real man, for example. Why is that so inept and incompetent? Uh, I mean, for example, I saw them. I, I thought of thinking about this. I, um, I, Jeremy Clarkson and his friends uh, went to Texas or Alabama, I think, and they wanted to be. One of their challenges was to get arrested. So one of them painted their car pink and said, "I love men," um, and it was, you know, deeply, deeply offensive. What can you do to change? that kind of attitude? Well, I think it's all about um, visibility because the only time that people like that change their attitude is when they're um, confronted with a situation that they find uh, uncomfortable in being forced to work, say, work with a gay man and then realising actually that their prejudice that they'd had up until that point are, are unfounded. Mm. Um, another actual an incident that I experienced um, uh, was the, the unit that I'd gone to were the, uh, the, the Royal Marines, and we were in, in a place called Sangin in Afghanistan. And when we got back, one of our, our people that came in at the last minute to, to replace a casualty was in his last three months of being in the Royal Marines. And so he had lived and died and been in that institution that's so, um, sometimes in that generation, so, so shrouded. And in the end, he said, um, 
uh, and his, his words were appalling, but his sentiment behind it were, was genuine. Um, they call gay people in the Royal Marines beefers. They have their own language for a lot of things. And uh, he, he came up to me and he said, Barnsley, you were a beefer, but you're a fighting beefer, and I respect you. So he'd worked with me. He, he'd seen that I could do my job when I needed to do my job, and that's really what he was worried about. And his initial, you know, he'd heard that I was the gay guy in the army that was with all these the Marines. His expectation was, oh, okay, I'm going to have to deal with somebody that's lame, and I wasn't. And so I challenged his expectations and, and met his other expectations of being a soldier, which was his, his measure. So did you have to be more of a soldier in order to kind of excuse your sexuality? Well, I think that had I not been, um, not been able to live up to his expectations of being a soldier, then he probably would have targeted me for being homosexual. Mm. And do you think if you're a not very good footballer, um, uh, I mean, you wrote about uh, Graham Lesseau, who was a good footballer, but he was completely accused. He had terrible homophobic chanting from the, the terraces. It's, it's a kind of extra insult. Mm. Um, and do you think it's used as, a, as, a, as an anti-badge, in a way, in football? Well, I played for Stonewall for three years, um, and I was a good footballer. And I was quite, when I came out, I was quite excited because I was like, we're going we're to teach some lessons here. Uh, we turned up to the, I turned up to, to play for Stonewall, and um, we had six new players in the team when I, the week I joined, and we just destroyed everyone. Because I think a lot of us come out at the same time. A lot of us were decent players. We had nine different nationalities in that team. We had a Brazilian guy, a Japanese guy. Very good-looking team, as I'll have to say. We were, you know, we, we did well. We did well. Um, and uh, were, were other teams, you know, cr- did, did other teams get cross? Because well, here's the funny thing. Yeah, it's it's classic. It was classic. So one time I was playing, and um, I was playing on the left wing for the first team actually, and we were um, we were beating these guys. And there was this guy who was kicking. You can tell, like, you can tell when you're playing football. You get a bit of needle from someone when it's a bit more. You can tell there's a, like an issue there if it's raised. It's some. Print. You can tell it was there. And I was like, this guy's having a favor. You could just see it in him, right? So we're completely like, you know, this guy's off my opposite man, and I was a bit tall, I was like, I'm 6'2", so I was a bit taller than him. And he was going, oh, I was kicking me, he goes, oh, you this, you that. He didn't actually say it, he never said anything homophobic. Then I called him and I was like, mate, you're losing 2-0 to us. What are you going to tell your girlfriend when you get home? <laughs> and he went mental. He went <laughs> out. Like, so you do get it, but here was the thing, like, I used to play for Stonewall, and actually, I had so much pressure playing those games. I played a lot of quite high-pressure games at school, whatever, um, at uni. But those games are the ones that really matter because I was like, we've got to beat them to show them a lesson. Like, we played one team, and when they lost to us, they were so horrified, they walked off at the end, no handshakes, nothing, no eye contact. The disgusting behaviour, the next time we played them, they were, like, completely different. There was so much respect. It was like, one of us got hurt. What had changed, then? They'd had conversations. They'd gone away because they hadn't lost on their home. We went past their dressing room, and they were screaming at each other. They hadn't lost on that. They hadn't lost on their home pitch for three years, and we beat them in their backyard, 3-2. And we went past their dressing room, and they were screaming at each other in fury. They were like, how the F could we lose to these lot? How the F? And the next time we played them, completely different. Respect. Yeah. yeah. Um, do you think they went home and said they were beaten by a bunch of I'm not sure. I, I'm pretty sure they haven't come out about that defeat to anybody. <laughs> 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 hey, hey, so what happened to that Stonewall game you were talking about? Oh, nothing. Yeah, it got cancelled. Yeah, it got... Yeah, yeah. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, well, <I laughs> you know they white that thing. I mean, do you, do you all think that they... That if there's been, because some, I, I've noticed this particularly with feminism, that there's been this kind of, yeah, 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 you've had your say, now we can just go back and be chauvinist all over again. Mm-hmm. Do you feel you have, that, have had that with gay rights? I think th- this debate comes out every year when, when Pride comes up again. Okay, oh, why are you doing a Pride march again? Well, actually, you know, there are still experiences for, for everybody, and, and if I relate it to, to soldiers, uh, a trooper that's 18 that's come from the middle of nowhere and has maybe not had that support, then gets to his regiment somewhere and, and has the experience that, that you were mentioning earlier. I mean, sort of, oh, where are, the, where are all the other out gay people? I thought it was okay to be, to be gay in the army. Um, and so that's why it's still needed. And actually, only two months ago, I was in Soho and me and my friends had decided to go out in drag, which is another challenge to, to people's perception of masculinity. And, you know, we had just gone out to, to have a good time and somebody actually stops their car on Wardour Street, and it was a, a Range Rover Sport, I think, and he, he wound his window down, or, you know, electronic, and he leaned out at me and said, Oi, mate, where'd you get that? 
at my outfit. And I thought, oh, well, actually, this top's from my friend, and, and this top's uh, these from my things, and I got these shoes from that person over there, and this wig is just, you know, it's just in the back of the cupboard. And he was like, you look a effing state. What the hell are you doing on the streets? And, you know, uh, chuckles from the background of his, of his little gang, and then he, he sped off as fast as he could. And I just thought... Oh, you, you stopped your car to give me that insult. Yeah, right. yeah. The off-road vehicle was probably the key in Soho. <laughs> <laughs> in Soho. <laughs> um, <laughs> sorry, sorry. We've got the changes in the law, but there are still massive changes that need to be done in attitude. And mm. t- to be really serious again, it's like not a month goes past when I don't read about a suicide of a gay teenager either here or in America. Right. And that's just here in America, mm. you know, God knows how much that goes on all around the world. Right. We're nowhere near getting there yet, right. you know. I still feel wary revealing my sexuality to, mm. to strangers, which I have to do because of the job I do. Um, until I stop feeling wary, and still, until gay people stop feeling wary of having to talk about their sexuality, then... What could help you feel less wary? I... You, you, Going back to your earlier question, you know, what, how do we change people's attitude? People are fearful of people that they perceive to be different to them. They can react to that fear with anger and aggression, or they can react to it by turning it into some figure of ridicule or fun and joking about it. And let, you have to show people, don't look at what the differences are, look at what we have in common, look at how similar we are. Mm. Don't concentrate on this one thing that you think makes us completely different. Mm. Do you think, um, Musa, how much do you feel that um, uh, non-homosexual men are worried that it might compromise their masculinity to allow in Well, here's the thing. I want to go back to the Jeremy Clarkson thing because I think he's a perfect example of someone who's... um, created this false edifice of what masculinity is. Jeremy Clarkson I find fascinating because he is someone who's fundamentally extremely conservative. He's made an entire career marketing himself as some kind of maverick. And what I find so offensive about this, uh, this, this pink car is actually what he's trying to do is he's trying to attack the root of, of, of being openly gay. He's trying to attack that as being a form of weakness and it's actually an incredible strength. And this is the thing, the irony of calling people who are gay soft is really remarkable because there's nothing actually I've done that's made me a man or I regard being a man more than actually coming out. And people need to understand the strength of that process and the strength of the people that do that and make that step. And, and how can we do that as a society? I think we just have to do it bit by bit, incrementally, and telling people like Clarkson to grow up. Yeah. You know, they have to grow up. Um, it, it's, it's a challenge, isn't it? Because there's a very confused attitude. I mean, I was brought up in a in a privileged, as you can tell from my voice, a very privileged environment, I went to a public school which had a very confused attitude to masculinity where, um, uh, I won't go into details, but I mean, uh, one of my friends was, was gay and so somebody wrote on the wall this amazing tautology, Puffy McNeil is queer. Um, <laughs> yes, uh, what does that mean? And uh, it was very looked down on, obviously. Um, but uh, to educate, I mean, is it, is, do you, how much do you think it's a fear of sex. I mean, I once had a... a it was rather Can hoot, I, but yes. Sorry to leap in again, really. No, sorry no, no, I was just going to tell it another pointless the, anecdote. The, the, no, no, the, the last time it occurred, I'm sorry to keep jumping in, but it's just that the last time I um, thought of this point a few minutes ago, I forgot it, so I'll say it now. If you look at rape culture, the fact that um, sexual violence against women is regarded as a pandemic by the UN, I think 30% of women worldwide have res- you know, been sexually assaulted at some point in their lives. And if you look at rape as being a tool of war, there's masculinity is in crisis because... Men, you know, this, this, this need to insert, to dominate, to be a top, to be aggressive, to be, you know, to rape and subjugate. And I think the fear that a lot of men have, straight men have, is of being sexually overwhelmed by a man. I think that's the thing. I think a lot of it is that. I think you see it in sport, you see it at certain times, you see it playing Stonewall. When certain challenges go in, people are scared, they come in a bit harder. And I've played a lot of football. You know when you're being kicked a bit harder than you normally, than you normally are. You know what that's about. And actually... The reason why they perpetuate the stereotype of the camp gay man is because that's the gay man they're comfortable with because that gay man is never, ever going to pin you down and do to you what you might do to a woman. So there's a lot of men who are basically prey to rape culture, who encourage it, who propagate it, who are scared of the same thing being done to them. I think that's what this is about. Absolutely. So how much do you think that in order to improve an understanding and acceptance, 
uh, men have to, I'm talking mainly about men because this is being man, have to have a less immature attitude to sexuality. How much they have to understand actually sex, I mean, less immature attitude to sex. Well, I think there needs to be um, an acceptance that um, uh, being a top and being a bottom doesn't necessarily mean um, also being more masculine and, and less masculine. Mm. And, you know, even if you are uh, being fucked, that doesn't mean you're being any less or any more masculine than anything else, or in fact, even more active or passive than anything else, because you can be, you know, an active bottom. Um, so I think just people being able to realise what they're comfortable in their own sexualities, and it doesn't mean that, you know, they want to go and get fucked, because that, that's not their thing, but just realising that being fucked doesn't make someone else less masculine, and accepting that what they... Um, their own sexuality and the way that they express their own sexual feelings um, uh, isn't going to be compromised by the way someone expresses their own. Mm. But how much is it based on fear, do you think? Oh, it's hugely based on fear, absolutely. Or I the mean, fear of becoming something else, or the fear of being turned on by it. I think it's the thing of everything. I think it's the fear of... There's, there's a hierarchy, there's an informal hierarchy that operates in society, and it's the heterosexual man at the top, and it's the woman, and then it's the gay man. And that's just absolutely the way, because a gay man almost is... A perversion. You've become. You've willingly chosen to become something. Why would you relegate? That's the thing. They, 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 why would you relegate yourself to the bottom of the sexual tree in a way? That's how people would perceive it, which is frankly nonsense. But that's. I think that's a big part of the of the equation. But of course, in it's a historic thing because in ancient Greece, it's considered the pinnacle of civilization or the love of man. On I'm not sure about the ancient Greece thing, to be honest. I'm really not sure even because that wasn't even that long ago. And even in ancient Greece, they had slaves. And Plato was, Plato was not a very nice guy. So I'm very wary of like. The, the, the Greek sort of hierarchy of what they regarded. Um, I think actually it goes back even further. I think there was a time actually when gay people, you know, gay men and gay women went out and were hunters and gatherers. I think they went out and they were explorers. They were like Marco Polos in the times before we had recorded history. And they weren't regarded as people who were bad. They were just people who were different. And they had, the, you know, that's what I think. Um, I wanted to ask, I'm going to throw it to you. So do think of some questions very, very soon. But do you think that actually in, a, in many ways um, you need to be more extreme, more campaigning than you even have been so far? Um, I think we have to keep doing what we're doing. And you why know, is it called extreme, of course? It's no, exactly. Why is it extreme? You know, I just want to live my life and be honest about who I am. I don't see that as being campaigning. I don't see it as, as rubbing people's faces in it. I want to continue doing that. I want people of all sexualities, all gay people, all bisexual people, all transgender people, just to be themselves attitudes only change I find attitudes change massively when people who were previously homophobic realise that they know a gay person or a family member comes out and attitudes change and you know that's, that's the best thing that can happen Carl what do you uh, sorry, can you... Um... No, you'd switched off. You'd sw <laughs> you switched off. I guess I, I, I looked at you another one. Um, no, do you think you have to be more campaigning? <laughs> sorry. I was not deliberate. I didn't... <laughs> He's not paying attention. He's gone. Um, Carl, do you, I mean, do you feel an onus on you? To, do you feel sometimes you have to be more campaigning, more out there than, than, you'd, um... like, than you'd like to be? <laughs> Do you, yeah. Well, yeah, I think so. Um, but then that, that, that actually ties in with everything we've, we've almost everything we've mentioned today. So um, making sure that you have the, um, uh, the, the football team, making sure that um, you're speaking about um, sexuality when, um, when, when it's asked upon and being, being honest in yourself. Because it's, it's really um, without that exposure, without those, because um, there's always going to be you know, two extremes really, those that are completely accepting and those that are, that, that think that gay people should die. The, the, the majority in the middle are just going to be, okay, well, I actually don't mind. But until there are more people saying that it's okay, everybody that is a little bit indifferent is never going to kind of push themselves to the right. I suppose what I'm trying to say is that um, we, I think we live... Musa, this is coming to you, just in case you're turning off too. I was actually about... I was nodding off, actually. Yeah. <laughs> nodding off. Um, <laughs> one of the things about this weekend is that traditional notions of masculinity, what might call traditional 1950s notion of masculinity, male provider, male dad, male authority figure, proper dad, proper son, uh, is not working. It's no longer a job for life. All these notions of masculinity don't work. They're dysfunctional. But men need to unlearn notions of masculinity and men need to come to a new understanding of masculinity. It, we live in different times. We live in what hopefully we call a post-feminist era, but 
never mind that. We, we certainly have to redefine what masculinity is. How much can gay culture help improve our notions of masculinity? Wow, okay, that's an essay question. Uh, um, yeah. look, here's a, very quickly, it's funny how um, the traditional notion of masculinity is being threatened by the crisis of capitalism. That's interesting because the male provider was based on a notion of um, the secure job, the job for life, and now that's, you know, the, the economy is being atomized with the automation of work um, and, you know, the internet destroying the value of the written word to a large extent. That's almost, it's almost this, this change hasn't been a social change, it's an economic change. So I'm very wary of, like, how much attitudes are, genu are genuinely changing uh, and changing according to uh, necessity. Um, in terms of what gay culture can do, here's the thing, like, I love sci-fi because I feel like sci-fi is a way of looking at the world from the outside. And I think that as gay people, it's really interesting. We have this vantage point where life kind of goes past like a marathon. We're kind of the spectators looking from the side, going like, why are straight people doing it like that? And, and I, I, think, I think the thing about coming out and, and, and being gay is that you have a different perspective on life, which is really valuable. There's some things you notice that, you know, if you're a straight person, you've got a family, you've got kids, you know, whatever, or you're in a, certain, a particular line, there's just some things you don't think about. There are some aspects. You look at trans people now. You look at, like, uh, Ros Caffney, for example, who edits... She's edited Neil Gaiman before. She's had an incredible influence on this canon of contemporary writers. And I think that as gay people are accepted more, people like Alan Turing, for example, you know, as, as, as gay people are accepted more, we can contribute more. You know, I honestly believe there are aliens out there. They must be like, why haven't they come to reach us yet? Why haven't they spoken to us yet? Well, well they're killing all the decent people. And they're, they're marginalizing all the minorities who actually could be helping them think of the great solutions. You know, if you look at our society and our literature, how many times have you got gay people disappointed represented in, you know, in the arts, in the intellectual arts? Because when people ask us our opinions, actually, we've got perspectives that are really worth sharing. And that's why we need more of them, and we need yeah. more here. Uh, how much, what, what's, what's, the, what's missing in the traditional no, notions of masculinity? And how can, how can gay culture improve? It's the same question. Um, what's missing is um, an acceptance that um, those predominantly uh, Victorian notions um, actually don't need to be the only um, accepted norm of masculinity. Um, you don't have to be a, a, a breadwinner. You don't have to be um, the person that is in, in charge in every situation. Um, and, and all these different things, you don't have to be Jeremy Clarkson to be masculine. And actually, <laughs> everybody exposed... Um, <laughs> Everybody um, expresses and, um, and demonstrates their masculinity in, in completely different ways, and that's fine. David, could, could uh, a masculinity that is more embracing of homosexuality be a more liberated masculinity? Absolutely. Um, <clears throat> I think about things like glam rock, I mean, which is some of just before my time, but... <clears throat> how that sort of, the massive impact that had of, on, on ma views of masculinity in the 1970s. <clears throat> and that was obviously sort of, took some tips from gay culture, you know, Bowie was hanging around with, with Lindsay Kemp and stuff in the late 60s. There was definitely anything that sort of breaks that very strict mould of masculinity. And it's, <clears throat> I'm not so arrogant to say that it has to come from a gay perspective, but there are more ways of being a man. And obviously, being gay highlights that. Right, your turn. Um, can we have some lights, please? Um, so, I suppose one of the things we're doing is, is really this weekend and next year, because we're going to do it again, is trying to reinvent, rethink what it means to be a man and, and, and what, what, that all, what that means for our culture and how can we improve, improve our senses of masculinity. So, if you've got any questions, I've got Angela and I've got Rachel. So, Angela, the, Angela and Rachel will pick you in a speedy way, so it avoids me saying woman in pink when it's a man or man in pink when it's a woman. So, Angela. Um, hi. Um, there's two questions or issues um, that I wanted to ask the panel about. So a role of perhaps a unique role also of bisexual men. I believe most of that you're bisexual, is that right? Um, yeah, yeah. And in terms of how maybe bi perhaps bisexual men are in a in a positive way, a unique position to, to form alliances or look at issues around what masculinity means. And also in that issue of alliances is why there aren't, say, more alliances between, if you want to call, uh, marginalised groups such as LGBT, um, non, uh, gay and bisexual men, 
uh, women and people from uh, minorities. I, I don't, to me, it's just, it was seen something straightforward, but it doesn't seem to happen. So. Do, you think, do you think there are not enough alliances, David? Um, yes, yeah, sometimes there are not enough alliances. I can only agree with that. Um, how does that, I think, why does that happen? I think some people focus a lot of their energies on fighting their own battles and fail to see that actually forming alliances may help them win those battles quicker. But I agree there aren't enough alliances. Well, alliances, if you think about like why groups um, fight among each other, marginalized groups fight among each other, if you think about it, like they're like rats in a sack. If a patriarchy oppresses a group of people in different ways, which gay people and you know, black people, whatever, or you know, what, gay people and women are, are oppressed. If you're marginalised that much, you end up fighting the closest, the closest, the closest person because the patriarchy is over all of you. Um, and in terms of being bisexual, how I've got a unique opportunity, well, I'm, I'm not sure that I do necessarily. Um, I attract a lot of suspicion from from women, from men. People might assume that I've got twice the choice. I really don't. Like I really don't. Um, what, you hap what happens to you is, and this is the thing, I, I didn't believe myself that bisexuality existed. I didn't believe that. When I came out to my girlfriend, she said to me, but are you not bi, though, because you like women? And I was like, well, no, I'm, I'm gay. Like, I've come out. And she was like, why are you so rigid? I'm like, no, I've, this is my path now. You know, I've gone down this. And that's complete nonsense. So the only opportunity I have is to tell people, do you know what these things are fluid than maybe we thought? And I had to learn, I had to go the long way around. I had to literally come out to everyone. And then it was like, Moose, you, you've, you've got a girlfriend now. And I was like, oh, it was actually harder. I had to come out as bisexual. It would have been easier to just carry on dating guys. So in terms of the unique opportunity I've got, I suppose it's just to really highlight the absurdity of these categories. Um, and also, like, you know, I have the, the, thing, the weird thing that if I go home with a guy, all of a sudden I'm taboo again. And if I go home with a girl, then it's great. And that's why, actually, it's really sad to say that my family are not really important to my decision-making process and it would be so nice to have their approval of my partner but but it's, it's never going to happen that way and I don't seek that well it, it might Rachel sorry okay um, I still hear uh, to this day you know like uh, he's all right but but you know, he's gay but he's all right yeah. and uh, which is quite deeply offensive and I still see the fear in people's eyes when they kind of you know, twig that you are gay mm. um, do you think then that it's more important to assert being a man first and being a gay man second in that, you know, you're just the same. We're all just the same. Well, it's actually the, um, somebody's fear and, and that twinkle in their eye when they realise that they're gay, um, that, that's the thing that, of course, that they're, they're worried about. And that's, that's the, they know you're a man, they can see you're a man already. And, and by, I think by trying to justify yourself as a, as a man before you say anything about being gay, you're actually undermining yourself as a gay person because it's saying, uh, it's pandering to that opinion of, okay, I need to tell you how masculine I am and now I'm going to tell you that I'm gay and that's okay because I've already told you how masculine I am. So, so actually, I don't, I don't think so. Um, I think that it, it just needs to be um, a, a, a natural discussion the same way that if you did, when you meet a new person and you say... Um, okay, do you have a, a partner? Well, yeah, I've, I've got a, a, a girlfriend and this is what we do and this is her name and she's a physiotherapist and, and whatever. It, sh it should be a, a natural opening up of your, your relationship with acquaintances. Oh, can I... Can I just, yeah. Very quickly, yeah, and here's the thing as well. Um, people may go and process your sexuality, you know, um, but one important lesson I learned, I think, was it, it was not my place to actually educate people in that sort of day-to-day -day context. Because if you think about it, if you explain something like your sexuality, it's completely normal to you. You don't explain your skin colour. Oh, you're black. Yeah, I, you know, I, you know, I, I, I chose. I, I, I chose I, I, it. I, well, what I happened was, you know, it. one day one Uganda met another Ugandan and they got together. And they, you don't do that. You don't do that. <laughs> and here's the thing: if you start explaining it, people start thinking there's something to be explained. Then the then the prejudice perpetuates. Oh, oh yeah. Um, have you got a girlfriend? I, I date men actually. Done. Then you move on as you, I'm sure you do and I'm sure people in here do, but it's about not even giving people room to like question something, which is just, it's just factual, it's factual. Does that mean you have to take control of the conversation though? You just have to be on the front foot with stuff, I think, just confident in yourself and be like, this is as it is, and then you just, you just roll with it. You don't... Yeah, you well, don't confidence you is the whole you, shouldn't, you can't make some... You might think this person might have a preconception about me Ex and my sexuality, exactly. but I, 
I have no idea what preconceptions this person may or may not have, and I don't want to go off on a rant just, you know, they could be cool with it. Yeah. They might have issues. I don't know exactly what those issues are. Get to know me as David. Don't get to know me as the gay man or that man. or You know, so I mm. try and assert this is who I am David without first. making yeah. assumptions about their preconceptions. Mm. Yes. Um... I just wanted to know what, uh, what everybody might potentially think about when it's felt in some, sometimes in our culture, I get the impression, as if there's a need to defer to the homophobia or the potential homophobia of the other guys. Uh, you, you, you may have come across this occasionally. It, I know it's sometimes used as arguments either in the army or in other walks of life. It's not that I have a problem with gay people but I know people who do or who might do and you know, it, I have to kind of be aware of their feelings uh, and you know, this is something that's you know, I, I, in my role as a lawyer I have encountered it mm. advanced with every semblance of seriousness as an argument or was at some point against sort of you know, allowing out gay people in the army, the name of the case escapes me at the moment I'm afraid but mm. it, yeah the same argument persists, it's not that I have a problem but I know other people might have a problem and we have to be mindful of them and why it's not you know, turned on its head. Yes. So you're asking, why, is there over-deference to homophobes, whereas and there's kind yeah. of over-deference that you wouldn't uh, uh, achieve in a racist comment, for example. You wouldn't say, well, we've got to be kind to racists because you know, <laughs> they have their feelings too. Um, <laughs> well, um, if the thing that I, I really picked up from that um, is, um, uh, yeah, it's okay, but these people are offended. Well, actually, in some ways, with you saying... I'm gay, you're giving responsibility onto that person as well. Um, and actually, it's up to them and to, to defend you as well, I think. Mm. Um, and because it's not okay if that person who knows you're gay has a conversation with someone else. Let's make it a, strip it down a little bit, make it a little bit more um, simple. But say, goes into a different social circle and says, hey, do you know that that car, gay, that car guy is gay? What's that all about? And so that, that guy, without responsibility, knowing you are gay, I think it's not beyond the realms of reasonableness for them to actually say, yeah, yes, it's, what's, what's the problem? There's nothing here. There's nothing here to discuss. You know, that, that person saying that. Do you think there's an over-deference to... Oh, of course there is. We're a minority. Of course there's a deference. There's always a deference to, to people in the majority, however, however prejudiced they are. Look at Jeremy Clarkson. Like, he's an, if an algorithm... If an algorithm had to design somebody who had mainstreamed casual homophobia, it would create Jeremy Clarkson. He is the result of, of, of some kind of grand, like, cosmic experiment to produce casual homophobia in the mainstream. So, of course, there's deference, but that's just a power dynamic. It's not, it's not a logical or um, a rational or moral, or moral thing at all. We were thinking of asking Jeremy Clarkson, by the way, <laughs> to be on this debate, but... He is a man. He charges 10,000 quid to speak. Um, and we thought it wasn't really worth it. Um, up here... Uh, Hello, um, I'm not Jeremy Clarkson, but I'll see what I can ask. Um, when I first sort of came out, came into London as a, sort of, as a bisexual man, I saw a community that I didn't really, I suppose, want to be a part of. I felt, found it quite sort of perhaps misogynistic at times, talking about the gay community, quite misogynistic, some of the things that you think you've named yourselves. So I thought I've had to almost try and build a community of having like, lesbian friends and this mixed group of people, which at times I think the gay community on the surface, it's sort of challenge. You, you, you look at Soho, it's very youth-driven, very white, quite, quite samey. Um, and when I'm sort of having conversations, particularly with my, some of my older gay friends, particularly if I bring my straight friends into those gay spaces, they, they, they sort of quite struggle with that. So it's very sort of two questions. How do you think we can... St our sort of straight male friends coming into those gay spaces, do you think that as a difficulty, that as an issue... And how, ca how can we, as sort of gay and bisexual man, create the community that we want to see? What do we, how do we need to act around that? Yes. Of course, it's quite hard for gay people to go into straight places as well. But, mm. um, David, mm. do you, have you... It's That's interesting you use the word misogyny there. It's quite strong. Do, do you, I think, that, I mean... The, another thing we've not touched upon with the whole masculinity thing is the way that some gay men have, have rebuilt their whole image on this very hyper-masculine idea, you know, just, you know, going back to the whole 70s clone village people thing, you know, so homophobia, you know, gay men, we all carry around internalised homophobia and that affects us massively. Mm. Um, 
the gay scene has changed greatly in the last two decades in the time that I've been covering it. Obviously, the gay scene was where gay men, in particular, went to meet other... Well, it's where gay people go to meet other gay people. It's where a lot of gay men go to pick up other gay men. That's changed massively with the internet, with mobile phone apps. Gay bars have been closing left, right and centre over the last 10 years. Mm -hmm. So the whole... The scene has changed dramatically, and the whole thing... Why might straight people feel uncomfortable in a gay bar? Well, they might, you know, in certain gay bars, I can imagine why they might feel uncomfortable. Nowadays, going to some trendy, mixed hipster venue in Shoreditch, I can't see why they'd feel uncomfortable. So that sort of thing is is changing, at, you know, at the moment. Um, I'm sorry, I've lost my... But I, did, I don't <laughs> think that was necessarily all the question. I think the question was actually... Um, sometimes it's I think your question was it's sometimes uncomfortable for gay people to go into a gay situation which can feel a bit cliquey um, yeah and I think that, that happens um, I, I see it's quite a clear reason if you take somewhere like Soho where I think what you have is quite a lot of examples of people that have come into London at you know 18 or whatever and suddenly they're allowed to be gay so they just become this uber gay mm. yeah and and that means that they um, uh, are disrespectful of other groups. It does happen, um, like gay men being disrespectful of, of lesbian groups, and there is segre segregation in bars, even in interchain. Um, and, and, and so I think it's actually about emotional maturity. I don't think it's about homosexuality. I think it takes another... It will take another few years for that example of a person that is excluding, say, in this case, um, uh, women or, or lesbians away from their their space, to have the emotional maturity to actually say, okay, well, actually, um, I've accepted myself and I can accept you. Yeah. And those are all great points, and I just want to add to, just to explain why the misogyny might be present. If you look at, like, the fact that we're ultimately, like, you know, gay male society is an extension of the rest of society, and we still live in a patriarchy, so you're going to get misogyny among gay men as you'll get it among, um, uh, you know, straight men. And the reason why I think it might be uh, exaggerated or accentuated is because a lot of those gay men don't like themselves necessarily that much, and they resent women because they knew if they were attracted to women, that would be a ticket to acceptance. And they look at women as something like, well, let me reject you before you can reject me in a way. So I think that's part of it. I, I've certainly noticed that thread of misogyny. I, I don't know if it's necessarily a subculture or a common thing, but it, it's definitely there. And I think that's why, that's why it manifests itself. Rachel, what's that person? Um, yeah. I'm, a, I'm straight, so I haven't experienced this personally, but I've seen uh, women express plenty of homophobic opinions towards gay men. Mm. And when they do, I've seen the same fear in them as you've talked about when men express that opinion. So obviously it's driven by a fear of something larger than just undermining my masculinity. And so what else do you think people are afraid of when they express homophobic opinions? Well, maybe that's just a, a, a fear of already being rejected. Right. Yeah, completely agree, yeah. yeah. And yeah. I think it, it, what I said about, I think pe if you perceive someone to be different, that can be scary for whatever reason. I don't think it's just about straight men feeling their masculinity are being, is being undermined. I think it just comes down to whether it's racism or homophobia or people from different countries. If you perceive people to be different and don't know how they might react to you in certain situations and that that's scares people. Actually, can I throw something as well? It's about desire as well and frustration to an extent. You know, a lot of women who have homophobic opinions are like, oh, that's not natural. What they're actually saying is a bit of a flip side, a less pleasant version of that saying, you know that saying, like, all the handsome men are gay, right? So you grow, you grow up thinking all the handsome men are gay. So the first I went to a gay bar, I was like, my goodness, like, it was tough coming out, but I was rubbing my hands together. I was like, you know, going to get in there, it'll be Brad Pitt, there'll be Paul Walker. You know, I was expecting wall-to-wall -wall beauty. And they were just regular people. Like, some are hot, some are not. Like, whatever, but there's a mix of people. And I think it's that, it's the fact that, like, it's the anger of, it's, you know, in my community, like, I'm regarded as someone, you know, meant to be eligible because I've got an education and I've got all this stuff. And there's an anger that you're not available. There's an anger, especially in minority communities a lot of the time. This person's educated, he can provide for his family, why doesn't he date women? Like, why the hell would he turn his back on us? And there's a fury there, actually, in some cases, that it comes from. So when, when I say it's not just undermining masculinity, I think it's all part of the same thing. It's patriarchy. It's undermining patriarchy by being a gay man. You're subverting just by being who you are. And some people are homophobic because that's all they've ever been taught. And also there, there's religion as well, which we've not mentioned. You know, I've heard men and women of, of whatever.
whatever religious doctrine come out with extremely homophobic comments. Yes, okay, well, I'm doing religion in 25 minutes' time, so, um, <laughs> <laughs> yes, over here, thank you. Uh, yes. I found what you said about uh, wearing badges very interesting. I just want to touch upon that. Um, so for both straight and uh, gay people, they touched upon how they wear, wear their different badges, but what do you think about wearing the badge that says, I have gay friends, I have a gay cousin or a gay family member? Is that a positive thing on the surface? Um, wh why do you think people feel the need to say something like that? Uh, do they? Um... In that instance, I think if somebody was um, uh, um, celebrating somebody else coming out, maybe they've seen somebody that's made um, uh, a reflection on themselves and then a, a positive statement about themselves. And isn't that something you mentioned earlier, Musa, in the, in, in the green room? Yeah, absolutely, absolutely. Look, here's the thing, like, gay people just want to get on with life. We just want to get on with life. Like, we're not actually, all, you, know, you know, the whole, it was funny, someone goes, oh, why are you going to have a pride march? Well, actually, the very question is why we're having a pride march. Because until you realise that a cultural event... I mean, no-one says, why do you have carnival in Rio? What are you having carnival in Rio? You're celebrating, you know, Brazil's past. Why are you having pride? Oh, we're celebrating an aspect of our culture. Do you know what I mean? That should never even be a question. Until people stop feeling the need to ask the question, we still need a pride march. We still need to wear badges, I think, in whatever form they manifest. Thank you. Thank you for...